Hi everyone. In this class, we are going to discuss about the overseas investment. I completely understand that it's a huge topic coming your way, and uh, it's a little difficult one, a little tricky one, considering the language which is being used in the rules and regulation. But I try to keep it short. I try to keep it simple, and more importantly, exam friendly. So we are going to study in such a manner that I tell you that which questions may be asked during your examination, and more importantly, what part you must. learn for your examination right so we'll quickly start and i am going to keep it in as short and crisp manner as possible fine without compromising on the understanding part of course because you need to understand the concept undoubtedly after that only you can learn anything right so first we are going to discuss about foreign exchange management overseas investment rules 2022 now if i don't tell you any background you know two things that whenever we are making an investment abroad it is overseas investment and if foreign people are making investment in india that is foreign investment so we have fdi we have odi foreign direct investment overseas direct investment right so we know odi we know fdi now in both these things there is involvement of foreign exchange and there are there for fema comes into play so fema we have already discussed that fema gives a lot of power to the sectoral regulator you can say that is rbi so rbi regulates these transactions and we also have central government of course so central government has the power under section 46 to make rules under fema and rbi has power under section 47 to make regulations in this regard using these powers they have come up with the rules and regulations so now when we talk about the topic of overseas investment which includes odi overseas investment is not equal to overseas direct investment overseas investment is a broader term which has a component of odi it also has opi it also has some non fund based uh, uh, things involved like guarantee okay so we will discuss that part but first of all whenever we are talking about the topic overseas investment you now have to remember that you have three things overseas investment rules which are made by central government overseas investment regulations which are made by rbi and we also have directions which you don't have to study as such right so first we will discuss the rules thereafter we will discuss the regulations when i talk about the rules we have 21 rules and five schedules therein so why my dear we are going to discuss about foreign exchange management overseas investment rules 2022 which consist of 22 uh, sorry 21 rules and five schedules now you may ask me ma'am that what was the need of this we are making an overseas investment that means our money is going out of india right so we are investing somewhere out of india so earlier we had transfer of or issue of any foreign security regulations and we also had trans acquisition and transfer of immovable property outside india regulation so these both regulations are now going to be suppressed and replaced by these rules fine so now we have complete clarity and let me tell you it's a beautiful welcome change by government and it provides immense ease earlier there was a time when there wasn't any um, self assessment tax i would say right or uh, there wasn't such a portal a beautiful portal like we have now um, with us to file our income tax return so conveniently on our own right likewise to under uh, government understands the need of growing business globally and that is why they want to provide the ease of doing business this way just like people out there want to raise funds from here want to bring in uh, sorry we want to raise funds from outside sources they want to bring in fdi for the development for the growth we also realize the need that our businessmen also need to expand globally right they also need to make a lot of investments and if they are doing business over there they need to acquire certain property so a lot of things are needed and to ease that here comes this beautiful rules and regulations which provides us the ease of doing business and brings clarity to a lot of matters okay 
so you don't need to know what was earlier what is now being so i'm i haven't made any comparison chart that this was earlier this has now been like there was joint venture there was wholly owned subsidiary now we have the concept of foreign entity control has been defined so you don't need that comparison chart at all i told you i'm going to keep it exam friendly so i'm going to keep it exam friendly okay so no extra uh, things that i am going to tell you i'm going to keep it short and i'm going to keep it exam friendly fine so we have few we start with the rules we have few definitions and undoubtedly when i tell you about the definitions the first thing that i'm going to explain you is about the overseas investment and thereafter we will discuss all the short uh, definitions which are there i will make you mark some definitions which you need to learn from the examination perspective fine okay ma'am so 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 the very first thing that i want you all to know one brief idea and thereafter we begin overseas investment because this is something which you must know before you actually read about this topic overseas investment we have something called as financial commitment and we have something called as opi which is overseas portfolio investment i hope you all realize the difference between direct investment and portfolio investment when i say opi and when i say odi i hope you all know the basic difference or the basic intent of the investor when we're making such investment whenever i'm talking about portfolio investment maybe i'm building some portfolio over there right so we are investing in some shares we are investing in some securities we are developing a portfolio and when we are making a direct investment that direct investment is definitely to acquire some kind of control over there right so when you acquire control that means that is some business that you are doing right and portfolio uh, i am a resident individual right i want to acquire some securities in the foreign market some security of some country over there maybe i am just developing my portfolio so that is an overseas portfolio investment that i have made right so there is a difference or there is an intent difference between direct investment direct investment the intention is to acquire control because maybe you are expanding the business or maybe you are expecting to expand the business in that particular line or in some other line right so in financial commitment where you made a, make a commitment of finances see when i start a business in india and i am contributing a capital of 50 lakhs that may that is my financial commitment over here right because i have committed an amount of 50 lakh but there is some investor or some um, shareholder who has purchased the shares of my company for 1000 2000 then that person hasn't made any finance commitment toward me he has just developed his portfolio so there is a difference between portfolio invest investment and overseas direct and direct investment in general we are talking about overseas investment so overseas investments is equal to financial commitment plus opi in financial commitment there in we have odi we have debt overseas direct investment is related to equity so we have debt these two or rather i'm not going to write it this way let me be more specific fund based and non fund based because you will read this at places and then it's going to bring you clarity so fund based is odi and it is debt right and non fund based is maybe guarantee or pledge right so i hope you realize one thing this is a pri when i say a person resident in india it could be a company also right so it could be an individual it could be a company it could be a body corporate it could be llp it could be a firm it could be a trust it could be a society it could be a mutual fund it could be right so we have person resident in india that is that is making an investment abroad or overseas now this pri could also give a guarantee abroad 
where actually there is no outflow of foreign exchange, but that guarantee may be invoked in future and there may involve outflow of foreign exchange, right? So that is non-fund based. That's why it is called non-fund based because the funds are actually not flowing outside, but yet there are chances, there is a contingency that it may flow, right? So this is overseas investment. Now we come back to the definitions act. It's FEMA. Authorized dealer, you already know what authorized dealer is, right? The only thing is, it shall mean only the domestic branches of such AD bank. So you fix a branch, right? Then we come to control. Earlier control was not defined. Now the control is defined, which you actually know. So it's not a very important definition. However, since it is new, then you may uh, keep it in mind. What is it? The right to appoint majority of directors or to control management or policy decisions exercisable by a person or persons acting individually or in concert directly or indirectly, including maybe you exercise control because you have some shareholding. So by virtue of shareholding, by virtue of any agreement, by virtue of any voting agreement that entitle them to 10% or more of voting rights. So what is control having more than or equal to 10% voting rights in short? So either you have the right to appoint majority of directors or you control the management policy. How do you control it? Uh, maybe you get the right of um, more than or equal to 10% of voting rights. So simple. Now, when we talk about disinvestment, when investing is putting money, disinvestment is withdrawing money, right? So you are withdrawing funds, right? So you have invested in equity. You are actually extinguishing that right which are involved to that equity capital. Right means what? Right to dividend, right to shares, right to right shares, bonus, all that voting. So you are extinguishing that right. Equity capital, well, you all know equity shares that are irredeemable. If they are redeemable, they are not equity probably. Now we come to financial commitment. This is the most important definition that you must know. Okay. And I have already told you this. Aggregate amount of investment made by PRI by way of ODI. So we come to ODI by PRI. Right. Debt other than OPI. So we also have debt. OPI is not a part of financial commitment. Right. You don't commit actually anything. So OPI is not a part of financial commitment. This everyone should know. Which among the following is not a part of financial commitment? If such MCQ is asked to you in examination and you've been given four options, remember to mark overseas portfolio investment. Now, in a foreign entity or entities in which ODI is made and shall include the non-fund based facilities extended by such person on behalf of such foreign entities. So it also includes non-fund based facilities like what like guarantee and pledge now let me tell you when i talk about these non-fund based um, uh, commitment or financial commitment this part is more included in regulation so when we go to the regulations part therein we have to read about this in rules we don't have about guarantee pledge we don't read about all that okay now okay there are there, this is another definition so this is another definition of financial service regulator. So I hope the definition of financial commitment is clear to you. Next, we move to financial service regulator. Right. What? Who is going to be the financial service regulator? Any service regulator which has been established. It includes RBI. It includes SEBI. It includes ADA. And it includes PFRDA. Right. So we have four authorities. What are they? RBI plus SEBI plus ADA plus PFRDA. Having said that, please get one thing in mind. When we talk about financial service regulator, that means it is regulating the entities which are providing financial services and what is meant as financial services. Financial services are what? Banking services, insurance services are also a part of um, undoubtedly financial services only. Right. So 
these are going to be the regulator then comes your foreign entity so this is also important then we come to foreign entity foreign entity means any entity which is incorporated outside india entity incorporated outside india including ifsc and it should have limited liability so three things that you have to keep in mind government is not allowing the person resident in india to make an investment outside india in such entities which have unlimited liability then then the person resident in india who is making investment outside india they will be actually very much troubled right government in india also is not promoting unlimited companies so how will they allow such um, investments to happen outside so one thing you have to ensure that okay fine if you are a person resident in india if you are a company incorporated in india if you trust whatever you can make investment outside india subject to the rules and regulations that we are studying but you have to ensure that such entity which is formed outside india should have a limited liability and such entity which is incorporated outside india includes ifs C. what is ifsc ifsc is the international financial services center which is incorporated under sez act in india so we have a special economic zone area therein we have IS, ifsc i hope you all know about it in gandhi nagar we have a gift city right so that is one um, ifsc center that we have in india so foreign entity means that center also see we consider that special economic zone as a foreign zone only so whenever we are in fact taking goods from there it is considered as imports so that entity is also foreign and foreign entities are also foreign what you have to remember is the limited liability however however if if there is an entity which or whose core activity is in a strategic sector whose core activity is in a strategic sector then this clause of limited liability will not be applicable okay ma'am what do we mean by strategic sector we will discuss that also fine so three things you have to remember host country or host jurisdiction means the country see host when we talk about host the people who invite so they are they are inviting us right so we are talking about that jurisdiction including ifsc in which the foreign entity is formed so we are not usually what we see we are the host country no we are not inviting if it was we were talking about fdi maybe we could be the host country but here we are not the host country the host country or jurisdiction is that foreign entity when we talk about indian entity now indian entity means company body corporate llp and firm right so we have four parts which are included ifsc i hope you know uh, what ifsc is and i have already told you last audited balance sheet as on the date not exceeding 18 months preceding the date of transaction so whatever we are whenever we are entering into a transaction of course before 12 months you'll have a balance sheet if you don't have it uh, properly given 18 months right not beyond that date listed foreign entity foreign entity whose shares or securities are listed on a recognized stock exchange outside india listed indian company you all know what it is mutual fund you know what it is net worth it's going to have the same meaning as we discuss in uh, the companies act so it's not important so far i have told you very less important definitions right okay next we come to overseas direct investment or ODI. Now, this, my dear, is important. Overseas direct investment. It means investment by way of acquisition of unlisted cap equity capital of a foreign entity. So, your foreign entity may be unlisted. It may be listed. Has limited liability. It must have limited liability, right? Now, when we are talking about unlisted company, that means we are making an overseas investment in an unlisted company. So, in an unlisted company, if we are making any investment, if you are making any investment, that is ODI. Any investment. Okay. Next, next. If we are subscribing to the memorandum, of course, we are making an, a direct investment. See, whenever you subscribe to the memorandum, that means you are the first subscribers, right? 
that means you are the ones who are actually starting that business so undoubtedly it's your financial commitment right so subscribing moa is going to be odi right acquiring capital of unlisted company odi subscribing memorandum of um, the foreign entity odi and if it is a listed company then we have to keep in mind what we have to keep in mind is that 10% or more of paid up capital more than equal to 10% of paid up capital we are talking about paid up equity capital undoubtedly because we are talking about odi i have already told you odi plus debt so you should have that clarity uh, for now or 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 investment with control where investment is less than 10% of the paid up equity capital of a listed foreign entity that means your uh, capital is less than 10% it is less than 10% but you have control okay so if you are subscribing anything in unlisted company it's odi if you're subscribing directly to the memorandum of association of a foreign entity it's odi if it is a listed company then you have to check one of the two conditions if they satisfy that is going to be considered as odi or the definition of odi is important is important there is one more clarification which has been given to us supposedly we invested in 12% i invested in 12% equity shares of a company abroad which is listed that means it is odi right now if 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 that um holding drops down to 9% that means now will it be considered as a part of opi the answer is no such investment shall continue to be treated as odi now this can be asked as a case study also so there this on the definition of odi you can have a proper case study which may be designed so you should know this that such investment shall continue to be treated as odi even if the investment falls below to a level um, below 10% of the paid up capital or such person loses the control we cannot say that okay even if the holding has dropped down to maybe 8% i still have the control maybe you have lost the control also if you have the control undoubtedly you come in this category and therefore it is odi right but if you have lost the control also after um getting the control that means once it has been classified as odi it will continue to be odi right overseas investment i've already told you overseas investment is a wider term which includes financial commitment plus opi and what is financial commitment that also i have told you now we come to the definition of opi which is not so important in comparison to the definition of odi it is other than odi so whatever is not odi but not in any unlisted debt instruments Uh, or any security issued by pri who is not uh, in an ifsc provided that opi by a person resident in india in the equity capital of a listed company even after its delisting continue to be treated as opi until any further investment is made in the entity so the same clarification is provided here also this definition is not so important you have to remember that whatever investment is not treated as odi comes in the category of opi right okay relative same as companies act resident individual a pri who is a natural person rfc account we have already discussed about the rfc account in uh, the chapter of fema rfc account resident foreign currency account once uh, suppose that you have been um, working abroad and thereafter you come back to india so you can open uh, a foreign currency account and you can hold all your foreign currency in that account which can be used for acquiring securities which can be used for acquiring properties outside india for that you do not need uh, all um, the time permission right so we have special rules for rfc accounts sebi you know that society you know that subsidiary or step down subsidiary you can simply write subsidiary of subsidiary is step down subsidiary okay so we have a b c so c is the step down subsidiary now comes your strategic sector on strategic sector the limit does not apply the limit that we studied right uh, the limit that means the limited liability rather 
<coughs> see every foreign entity must have limited liability however if you are investing in strategic sector then limited liability the um, restriction of limited liability is not applicable what is strategic sector oil gas na coal natural um, mineral ores right submarine cable system and startups and any other sector or sub sectors as deemed necessary by central government sweat equity shares you know that trust you know venture capital fund you know and uh, that's it so we are done with the definitions and now we begin the main rules administration of these rules rule number 3 so of course these rules are going to be administered by rbi in fact rbi has the power that it can issue more directions it has actually used the power and issued directions in this regard uh, for overseas investment circulars instructions and clarification so i hope that is clear now non applicability in certain cases rule 4 ma'am do we need to remember the rule numbers the answer is absolutely no you don't need to remember the rule numbers as such however if you are so um intellectual that once you read the rule numbers and it's all in your mind then of course i wouldn't say that you don't learn the rule numbers but there is no need to learn the rule numbers okay so what <clears throat> these rules plus the regulations they are not going to apply if the investment is made from ifsc of course ifsc is already a foreign entity we read in the definition of foreign entity so if you are making an investment outside india by a financial institution in an ifsc it's foreign to foreign why will these rules be applicable right so from ifsc it's not going to be applicable then if you are making any acquisition or transferring any investment which you are making from your rfc account these rules and regulations are not going to be applied from the resources outside india that means maybe you are earning something over there you have resources over there and from your, that resources only maybe you have some securities you sold those securities and you are buying another security it's okay right so it is not going to be uh, these rules and regulations are not going to be applicable if you are making any acquisition out of foreign currency resources which are held outside india right by a person who is employed in india for a specific duration irrespective of length thereof or for a specific job or assignment duration of which does not exceed 3 years clear and if you are making investment according to section 6 now section 6 sub section 4 actually tells us that we can hold foreign currency if it was um, inherited from a person resident outside india maybe i have my grandparents in uh, london and they passed on certain property to me in london now of course i can hold that property right so these rules and regulations will not come into play if i'm holding the property in accordance with section 6 sub section 4 so we have these case four cases of non applicability and i have given you heading in such a manner that you will undoubtedly remember these right so this is going to be exam friendly because i understand at last moment you cannot go and read and remember all the points in the rule so what you can do is you can understand once and you can learn these points and thereafter you can present beautifully in the manner best known to you right rule number 5 debt and non debt instruments so this may be asked as even a direct question to you although direct questions are not asked in examination more importantly but then as a part of some case study maybe they can elaborate and straight away ask to you so what are debt instruments this is some part of learning involved government bonds corporate bonds all tranches of securitization structure which are not equity tranche right borrowings by firms through loans are also debt instruments and depository receipts we all know that depository receipts are now i hope you know the process we have read about idr we know about gdr we know about adr when you understand the process you realize that there are some underlying what are idr they are derivative solely right so we have some underlying security that underlying security could be equity also and that underlying security could be debt also so if that underlying security is debt then the depository receipts will be considered as debt instruments and if the underlying security is equity then those depository receipts will be considered as non debt instruments over here right okay thereafter any investment made in equity 
capital participation in llps also equity or it's non debt only because that's um, undoubtedly you are investing in the capital only right then all instruments of investment which are recognized as fdi right so in fdi policy whatever instrument has recognized as investment they are also considered as non debt when you invest in the units of aif reit right uh, iit iit is um, infrastructure investment trust not that iit okay investment in units of mutual fund exchange traded fund which invested in more than 50% in equity right so their inclination is towards equity and um, the junior most here that is the equity tranche of securitization structure um if you are acquiring immovable property for contributing to trust so more or less i believe you should know the meaning of the entire list that is being given over here even when you're talking about one difficult point over here that is securitization structure uh you may have not read about this process of securitization um because this is somehow covered in the surface act but then um you can simply understand that um, I, i will actually skip that part of explaining securitization structure to you and because that is something which is absolutely not needed you can just understand just like in dr we have equity and debt instruments both here also we could have equity tranche and debt tranche and accordingly they have been classified right you will never be asked in question more than that continuity of certain investments this is a transitional um, rule which is irrelevant actually so any investment of financial commitment outside india in accordance with the act or the rules or regulations made there under and held as on the date of publication of these rules so when these rules came into the picture you already had some investment you already had some financial commitment they shall be deemed to have been made under these rules and regulations simple nothing at all so strike it off you don't need to learn it for your examination you don't need, even need to read it for your examination right this also you don't need you just have to remember one thing from objective type of for mcqs just remember this for mcq nothing more than that right this four point will help you completely here you need to remember these parts this you don't need to read the rule number 7 it's again just a clarification that if i am a person resident in india if there is a resident entity which you are talking about now they have acquired some capital of any foreign entity and that foreign entity is giving us a rights issue can we invest in that yes you can invest in that can we get bonus shares from that yes you can get bonus shares from that now whenever they give us right offer we also get the right to renounce the shares so can we exercise that right yes you may renounce it in favor of a person resident in india or even in favor of a person resident outside india so this rule 7 is just a clarification okay nothing important in this also prohibition on investment outside india strike it off because it just says that except as otherwise provided in the act or these rules or regulations made no person resident in india shall make or transfer any investment or financial commitment outside india of course we know that that's why we are reading the rules and regulations we know that we have or we can transfer any investment we can make any investment according to these rules and regulations only apart from that we cannot do that right so we know that so no need to read rule number 8 then we come to rule number 9 which is overseas investment this is kind of important rule from our exam perspective okay fine now any investment made outside india so you are making an investment outside india by person resident in india person resident in india it shall be made in a foreign entity it shall be made in a foreign entity but you are going to invest in only such entity which is engaged in bona fide business activity bona fide business activity means which is a genuine business activity genuine business activity what you will consider if there is an entity which is involved in kidnapping will you will the government allow that okay fine go ahead and make investment in that Uh, uh, entity which is engaged in the business of kidnapping there is a lot of scope so you will make lots of money and you will bring back that money repatriate all the money to india no government will never allow this to happen right so bona fide business activity means the business activity which is permissible under any law enforced in india 
and the host country that means it has to be such business activity which is not just permitted over there it has to be permitted in india also so according to indian laws also if it is a bona fide business activity and according to their laws it is a bona fide business activity and the foreign entity is being involved in such bona fide business activity there only then only you will make an investment so first requirement is that bona fide business activity second requirement you can make a direct investment you can make an investment through subsidiary you can make an investment through special purpose vehicle also like maybe forming a trust right but it is going to be subject to the limit that means within the limit which is specified in the uh, regulations and it is going to be subject to the conditions other conditions which are laid in these rules and regulations right so important points bona fide business activity through directly subsidiary uh, spv subject to limits subject to conditions right and what is bona fide business activity that also you must know this can also be asked as an mcq to you what is bona fide business activity the business activity which is permissible in the host country the business activity which is permissible in india business activity which is permissible in both and none of the above right so you will choose in both now next question compliance with the structural requirement okay so structure of subsidiary or sub, uh, step down subsidiary shall comply with the structural requirement of the foreign entity so whatever it is whatever is the structural requirement this point is not important at all you will comply with it prior approval of cg in certain jurisdiction what is it if you want to make an investment in an entity which is incorporated in pakistan or any other jurisdiction which may be advised by central government from time to time that will require approval from central government so if you want to invest in an entity which is incorporated in pakistan or other entities which as may be notified by central government then in such cases you need approval of cg otherwise you do not need approval of cg fine okay next ceiling we discussed over here right limits so likewise reserve bank if it considers necessary then after consulting central government it can stipulate the ceiling that the aggregate outflows during a financial year on account of financial commitment or opi that means it can put a ceiling that okay fine this much million dollar this is the maximum amount that you can um contribute towards financial commitment or maybe towards opi right rbi can also this is again something which is not important rbi can again stipulate the ceiling beyond which you will need prior approval so ideally you can say just like in fdi we have automatic route and approval route automatic route that okay fine we have a proper chart if you want to invest in this particular sector up to 49% of the investment it is permitted you don't need any approval right but beyond that you need approval so here also rbi has the power to put a ceiling that up to this, this much aggregate outflows you don't need any permission thereafter you need prior approval fine so this is something which is permitted so rbi has the power to do that investments above limits allowed in strategic sector on permission see if you are investing in strategic sector then undoubtedly you can do that but it is going to be subject to permission so if you are investing in an entity which is involved in strategic sector as we discussed above so supposedly they have um, uh, some mines or something like that right so central government you make a, an application to central government through rbi they permit you that okay fine you can invest beyond that particular limit so you can go ahead and invest beyond that particular limit also okay now this is a generic point RBI on an application through AD Bank for sufficient reasons, they can permit PRI that you can make or transfer any investment outside India subject to the conditions as may be laid down by it. So simple and general point. Fine. This was the most important point in this particular rule, rule number nine. Then we come to rule number ten, non-objection or no objection certificate, which is called as NOC. which is again an important point or important rule for your exam <coughs> 
who needs noc if i am a person and i want to make a foreign investment right if i want to make an overseas investment then i might need noc if my account is appearing as npa if i am a willful defaulter being classified by any bank right or if against me there is an investigation going on by cbi or by enforcement directorate as uh, maybe i have done some committed an offence of uh, money laundering or something like that or sfio which you have read in the companies act right serious frauds investigation office so if i was uh, a part of a company which is involved in some fraud and sfio has taken up the case right so if investigation is going on in that case willful defaulter and npa all these category of people before you make any financial commitment or before you disinvest you have to obtain noc from that particular authority maybe there is a lender bank or maybe there is regulatory body or maybe there is a investigating agency like sfiu so you have to make an application to them and they give you noc and thereafter you can um, go ahead for the financial commitment right noc will be given by the lender bank or the agencies it will be addressed to the authorized dealer bank because authorized dealer bank ad category 1 banks are the channel of obtaining foreign exchange so if you want to invest outside india if you want to make an overseas investment then undoubtedly you will go to ad category 1 banks only no authorized dealer to obtain foreign exchange so if you are a willful default, defaulter when you go to the ad bank you have to carry you, with you the noc also so noc will be issued by the lender bank or the investigating agencies addressed to authorized dealer bank right now there is a punch what is the punch ma'am which can be asked as an mcq also what is the punch supposedly i make an application i don't want to be a willful defaulter ever uh, but supposedly it is so and i want to make an overseas investment i hope you all know what willful defaulter is when you actually have your pockets filled with money but generally you are not repaying the loan we have a lot of people in india like that i, I don't want to take names so if i am the willful defaulter and i made an application to my lender bank that okay you give me noc to make overseas investment and that bank fails to give me noc okay fails to furnish me the certificate if they fail to furnish me the certificate within 60 days i can presume that noc has been granted now this is terrible why so what is the purpose of making this then right because if we want to prevent these people that they should they have already hampered the economy of india enough they shouldn't go out and hamper the others economy or maybe they are actually not repaying the loan over here and taking that money outside india and investing over there so we should we, when we don't want to um, this to happen then this presumed or deemed noc clause should not be there but it is there fine making or moving to rule number 11 moving to rule number 11 okay now rule number 11 12 13 14 15 we have been given the procedures we have been given the procedure let me take you like this okay mm -mm -mm. rules and schedules rules and schedules rule sorry 11 red with schedule 1 rule 12 red with schedule 2 rule 13 red with schedule 3 rule 14 red with 
शेड्यूल फोर रूल फिफ्टीन इज रेड विद शेड्यूल फाइव सो दे एक्चुअली ब्रिंग इमेंस क्लैरिटी इन मेकिंग इन द प्रोसीजर of making investments okay so we know that schedules if if it is a schedule under any act they provide us a lot of additional information right so the schedule is doing it is providing us a lot of procedural information what type of procedural information is it providing ma'am so It's not actually fitting in, but that's completely okay. I hope you'll be able to understand because my motive is not to make some handwritten charts over here, but my motive is just to explain you, right? So listen to me very carefully. In Rule Eleven, we have the Indian entity. By far, you have understood the meaning of Indian entity, right? We discussed it in the definition. Four parts are covered. Four um, points are covered in Indian entity. We have company, we have body corporate, we have LLP, we have firm. So when Indian entity is making ODI, sorry, when Indian entity is making ODI. overseas direct investment in foreign entity how do you do that the procedure is being given in schedule 1 and manner that we read in rule 11 ideally in these rules 11 12 13 14 15 we don't have anything the content is there in the respective schedules in rule 12 we have again an indian entity which is making opi in foreign entity in foreign entity okay then we have rule 13 when we are talking about the resident individuals who is a person resident in india which is a natural person right we read about the definition so resident individual who is making an overseas investment overseas investment which includes the entire thing okay overseas investment in foreign entity in foreign entity right then rule 14 when we talk about we talk about other person resident in india other person resident in india that means we have striked off um company we have striked off body corporate we have striked off llp we have striked off firm and we have striked off the resident individual also so you can say the leftover person resident in india they are making an overseas investment in foreign entities in foreign entities okay and thereafter we have uh, overseas investment in ifsc by pri so here we cover all types of person resident in india who are making overseas investment in ifsc so manner of making investment is being given in these rules and they have to be read with the respective schedules okay fine so manner of making odi an indian entity may make odi by way of investment in equity capital for the purpose of undertaking bona fide business activity we have already discussed that in the manner and subject to the limits and conditions as provided in the schedule so nothing by far odi may be made or held by way of subscription so you can subscribe to the memorandum or you can purchase equity capital which may be listed which may be unlisted you can also go through the bidding process in examination you may be asked that in what ways can an indian entity make an overseas direct uh, investment outside india if yes what are the limits and conditions <coughs> imposed so you have schedule 1 uh, and in that these are the limits which have been given right you can also acquire through rights or bonus you can also acquire through capitalization capitalization of something means uh, maybe there was a debt which has been uh, now capitalized or converted into equity right um th these are the same points 
under the actor regulations then the swap of securities uh, that means the barter system that goes on right we are acquiring securities and in exchange we're giving away some securities right so maybe we are issuing the securities or maybe there is some merger demerger amalgamation and thereafter we are acquiring the security so in all these ways an indian entity may acquire securities very simple now comes your odi in financial services activity financial services activity i have already told you uh, whenever we are talking about financial services activities it may include investment uh, you know, sorry it may include insurance it may include the banking loans and all that right now there are two points an indian entity which is already engaged in financial services activity in india they are making odi in foreign entity which is also engaged in financial services activity this is case number 1 case number 2 an indian entity which is not engaged in financial services activity they are making odi in foreign entity which is directly or indirectly engaged in financial services activity right so these are the two points we have but before that before these two points i want to take you to an overriding effect clause here oh notwithstanding means overriding so notwithstanding anything contained in this paragraph overseas investment by banks and nbfc they are being regulated by reserve bank they have separate conditions which have been laid down by reserve bank so we do not include the banks over here so you have to keep this in mind that we are not talking about the banks we are not talking about nbfc we are talking about other entities which may be involved in financial service um, sector right which could be an insurance company also okay so we may have an indian entity which is already engaged in financial services activity and they are making overseas direct investment in another foreign entity which is also engaged in financial services activity so you have to comply twin conditions both the conditions need to be complied with what are the what are both the conditions condition number 1 you should have net profits during preceding three financial year you should have net profit preceding three financial years and you are registered or regulated by a financial services regulator in india simple right so point number 1 is more important fine so you will take the approval from your respective regulator here also and in the host country also what is financial service uh, if 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 what will be considered as the financial service if it undertakes an activity which is carried out by an entity in india requires registration or is regulated by a financial service a sector regulator in india like if we talk about insurance companies in india we have a financial service uh, sector regulator like ida right so we have a regulator now we do not know about the laws of the other country we consider that particular uh, entity to be a financial service um, uh, an entity which is rendering financial service activity if in india had it been incorporated in india it would have been regulated by a financial sector regulator and it would have required registration so we consider that foreign entity to be engaged in financial service activity i hope that's clear right not very important but i have made that clarity right okay now an indian entity which is not engaged in the insurance um, okay fine so this part is clear now we come to the next part that means i am an entity an indian entity i am a person resident but i'm talking about an entity so i am an entity which which is the not engaged in financial service activity in india however i want to make an investment in fsa over there right okay except banking or insurance subject to the condition that such entity has posted net profits during the preceding three financial years so you can do that but you should have profits in three financial years right but banking and insurance is not incorporated not included over here fine ma'am however supposedly i am involved or i am um, doing some business in the health industry over here and and i want to make odi 
in this health insurance i know that i am doing business over here in the health industry if i make an overseas direct investment somewhere over there in health insurance that is the financial service activity area right if i do that investment it is going to support the core activity which i am undertaking over here that can be permitted that will be permitted clear fine now one clarification with respect to one clarification with respect to covid because due to covid the finances the balance sheet the figures of many entities dropped down and the financial results were worse than ever before right so considering that there was a huge decline in the profit there might have been a huge decline in the profitability of certain companies during the covid period what has been clarified is that if there is an entity and it does not meet the net profits due to the impact of covid-19 during 2021 21 22 then the financial results of such period may be excluded from considering the profitability period of 3 years so if you have three periods out of that the two years are of covid you will just take that one year profit and thereafter you will check the eligibility criteria that whether you are eligible to make an overseas direct investment outside india in the financial sector or not right clear fine so i hope this is clear how do you make uh, overseas direct investment these are the ways if you are talking about financial service activity whether you are involved in financial service activity or not if yes you have to uh, comply with these two conditions if no then also you have to comply with the condition of profit and um, this is i think so clear now one very important limit from mcq perspective is this whatever is your net worth 400% of your net worth your financial commitment is not going to exceed that simple okay now the total financial commitment it includes the capitalization of your retained earnings so when you are obviously counting your net worth your net retained earnings will be a part of net worth okay but what will not be included utilization of the amount that you have raised by issue of adr or gdr and utilization of proceeds from ecb so if you have taken some ecb and you have utilized that that is not going to be a part of your net worth fine so these are just two clarification so if in examination it may be asked that what is the part of net worth so of course adr gdr are not going to be the part of net worth right uh, retained earnings are going to be the part of net worth and ecb and all are not going to be the part of net worth fine now we have this limit of 400% of its net worth however when we talk about the strategic sector as we have discussed before also so if there is any financial commitment which is made by maharatna or navratna i hope you all know about this this is the basic general knowledge that we can have right or mini ratna or the subsidies of such public sector undertakings in foreign entities in strategic sectors on them these limits are not going to be applicable so they can make overseas direct investment even beyond that limits fine clear okay ma'am now rule number 12 let's come back to our um, chart rule number 12 is what an indian entity is making opi that is overseas portfolio investment manner of making opi by an indian entity right so indian entity shall make opi not a problem which shall not exceed 50% of its net worth okay a listed indian company may make opi including by way of reinvestment that means some uh, part has been withdrawn or redeemed again you are reinvesting that that's completely fine right and the last point don't even um, think about it uh, simply strike it off not a problem right rule number 13 now manner of making overseas investment by resident individual any type of overseas investment so everything is going to be incorporated uh, by this uh rule everything is going to be covered by this rule 13 only so we have the schedule schedule number 3 um, and we have a huge list which is being given to us but it's com- it's very easy don't worry about it the most we have two schedules which are actually long one was the schedule number 1 and then there is this schedule number 3 but it's easy don't worry at all 
Resident individual may make ODI. So first we are talking about overseas direct investment by way of investment in equity capital or OPI in the manner provided in the schedule unless otherwise provided under. under. Now listen to me very carefully. Shall be subject to overall ceiling under LRS. We know that Reserve Bank gives us a scheme, liberalized remittance scheme, under which we have 250,000 US dollar per financial year per person, from which if we make uh, or if we utilize that um, ceiling and make some investments or we have of course permitted things, we have some transactions, if we do that, we don't need to take any approvals. Right. So this over these investments has been a part or we don't have a separate ceiling or limit under that. We it is going to be subject to that overall ceiling only. So if you're moving out and you have utilized that LRS for studies abroad within that you can utilize for making investments abroad also. So you, that you can do uh, ODI also, which is not engaged in financial services activity or which does not have subsidiary or step down subsidiary. Right. Where the resident individual has control in that foreign entity. No. Right. So if I am a resident individual and I want to uh, make an ODI, make overseas direct investment in a in foreign entity which is involved in financial services activity, that is not permitted. Okay. I can make ODI. I can make OPI including by way of reinvestment. ODI or OPI capitalization that means maybe conversion of debt in, in debt into equity swap of securities these are all the things that we have already discussed before swap of securities means exchange of securities I'm giving away securities of A limited to get the securities of AB limited maybe because of <coughs> acquisition merger demerger whatever it is right acquisition of equity capital through rights issue or allotment of bonus I may get gift, I may get, uh, maybe I'm inheriting something, maybe I'm getting sweat equity shares because I'm uh, working over there, right? Maybe I'm acquiring minimum qualification shares, minimum qualification shares are what um, the directors, if you want to become a director of a particular company, uh, under that law, in India, we do not have the requirement of qualification shares under Companies Act, but under that law, maybe there is some minimum qualification shares required. So if you want to become the director of that particular company, then you need to hold minimum these much shares, then only you can have that post. Okay, so maybe you have a minimum requirement of holding 10 shares, so you have to hold that shares and that is of course permitted subject to overall limit of uh, LRS, right? Acquisition of shares under ESOP, very easy. No problem at all. Now, provided that ODI in respect of E, F, G and H may be made in a foreign entity whether or not such foreign entity is engaged in FSA or has a subsidiary or step down subsidiary. So we read this, um, we read this restriction that you cannot make ODI if it is involved in FSA. Right. But if you're working in an, in a, if you have inherited that, you don't have a choice. If you are <coughs> working in a company which is involved in financial services and you're getting sweat equity shares, you cannot do that. Minimum qualification shares, that is law. You cannot deny that. ESOP, you cannot deny that. Right. So that is exception. Acquisition of less than 10% is going to be treated as OPI, simple. So if your acquisition is 10% or more, it is ODI. If it is less than 10%, it is OPI for a resident individual. Right? Okay, um, this we have already discussed, so I'm not discussing it again. You can strike it off, not a problem at all. Acquisition by way of gift or inheritance. Now, resident individual without any limit. See, if you're inheriting, that cannot be within the li limit of LRS. So if you're inheriting, then um, there is no limit at all. So without any limit, you can inherit. Without any limit, you can obtain the gift from your relative. So if you're, there is a relative and he's holding securities and you want to gift you, without any limit, you can acquire that, right? If you're inheriting without any limit, you can inherit that, right? Resident individual may acquire foreign securities by way of gift from PROI in accordance with FCRA because FCRA also places certain restrictions which we have read, right? So according to the provisions of FCRA, you can obtain that. Acquisition of shares or interest under ESOP 
or sweat equity shares. You know the difference between ESOP and sweat equity shares. We have separate sections for the same under Companies Act wherein we have discussed this. Right. A resident individual who is an employee or director or uh, of an office in India or branch of overseas entity or a subsidiary in India of an overseas entity or of an Indian entity in which the overseas entity has direct or indirect equity holding, you may acquire without limit. Shares under ESOP or maybe uh, sweat equity shares provided that scheme is offered on uniform basis. That means that scheme is not just on you. If it is Globally, on a uniform basis, you can acquire without any limit. So we have certain things that we have to remember that we have an overall ceiling limit of LRS. What is the limit under LRS? The limit under LRS is 250 US dollar, right? We all know that. However, when we are obtaining by way of inheritance, no limit. When we are obtaining by way of gift, no limit. And it is going to be subject to FCRA that we have to keep in mind because then we have to do some reporting. If you obtain gift from our PROI, then we have to do some reporting, right? So we have to keep all that in mind, right? If we fall into that category of people who cannot obtain gift like this, then we have to do that reporting, clear? So under FCRA, you have to sub it is going to be subject to the regulations of FCRA. And when we're talking about ESOP or equity, sweat equity, then also it is without any limit provided it is issuing that scheme on a uniform basis globally. Okay. Fine. This explanation is not needed, although it is self-explanatory, you can read it. Next comes investment, overseas investment by PRI other than Indian entity and resident individual. So that means the leftover PRI or other PRI you can say, right? Other PRI means what? It could be a trust. It could be a registered uh, society, right? Okay. So any person being a trust or a registered society engaged in educational sector or which has set up hospitals may make ODI in foreign entity with the prior approval of RBI. So you need prior approval of RBI to make overseas direct investment. Prior approval of RBI. Right. If engaged in educational sector or hospitals. If you set up hospitals in India. But it is also subject to certain conditions. The foreign entity is also engaged in the same sector. Okay. The trust should have at least three financial years before which should have been in existence. That means you should not be a new Indian entity. Right. You should be in existence for at least three years. Okay. If it is a trust, then you will have a trust deed. So whatever your rules and bylaws are, they should permit making ODI. Then only you can make uh, go ahead and make an ODI. If it is a trust, you need the approval of your trustees also. Right. And sometimes maybe you need special license or permission from ministry. So that also you need to obtain. And thereafter, only you can make these investments. Simple one. Now, Overseas investment by mutual fund or venture capital funds or AIF. I hope you all know how mutual funds operate. They collect money from a lot of people and they invest it in the market. Maybe they can invest in the domestic market. They can invest in overseas market also. Now, if they want to make an overseas investment, can they do it? The answer is yes, why not? So this mutual fund or maybe venture capital fund or maybe alternative investment fund, they can acquire or they can even transfer the foreign securities as allowed by SEBI from time to time according to the provisions of this rule. Okay. Aggregate limit for such investment shall be decided by RBI in consultation with CG. Individual limits will be decided by SEBI. Okay. Every transaction shall be routed through authorized dealer only. Okay. And any investment under these rules, they are going to be considered as OPI only. Because your purpose is never to make a financial commitment. Your purpose is only to develop your portfolio. 
you can withdraw you can again invest right you are doing a lot of you you are just earning returns and you're passing on the returns to the persons who have purchased your mutual fund units so that is your intention your intention can never be that financial commitment so it's going to be treated as opi only it's not going to be treated as odi right okay opening of dmat accounts by clearing corporations of stock exchanges and clearing members so any person who is a sebi approved clearing corporation of a stock exchange they may acquire hold these are the general things see if there is a depository it will hold a lot of securities if it is a clearing house it will hold a lot of uh, securities for of course different reasons and different laws we are not supposed to read that but we know that we have a sebi approved clearing house they may acquire hold or transfer foreign securities which are offered as collateral by foreign portfolio investors so if there are foreign investors who are investing in our country right uh, a lot of times they need to provide certain margin money they need to provide certain collateral securities for undertaking the transactions here in in our stock exchange market right in such a situation the clearing house can hold the securities right so this is something which is allowed not so important likewise when we are talking about the domestic depository domestic depository can also hold acquire transfer foreign uh, securities of a foreign entity right if they are lying as an underlying security maybe in case of idrs that we are issuing and ad bank can also acquire or transfer foreign securities according to the terms of host country or host jurisdiction in the normal banking business so these three points are absolutely clarificatory and um, there are very high chances question should never be asked from these points now moving to the rule um next rule rule 15 overseas investment in ifsc by pri so here we cover all types of person resident in india and they are making an overseas investment in ifsc which is also considered as a foreign entity right so you can do that subject to the rules a person resident in india they can make overseas investment in ifsc in the manner as laid down in schedule 1 2 3 or 4 provided so whatever category you fall in you can make like investment in ifsc also subject to some additional conditions which have been imposed over here what are the additional conditions in case of an odi made in ifsc you need approval by financial services regulator concerned if there is any so if you are such an entity uh, and you are being regulated so of course that is uh, needed it shall be within 45 days from the date of application deemed approval if failure an indian entity which is not engaged in financial services activity if you want to make odi in foreign entity which is directly or indirectly engaged in financial services activity except banking or insurance who does not meet the net profit condition as required under these rules may make odi in an ifsc so if you are not an entity which is involved in fsa but you want to make odi in foreign entity which is involved in fsa but you do not meet the criteria of 3 years net profit as required so you cannot make this investment however you can go ahead and make an investment in ifsc ifsc is also what engaged in financial services activity so you can go ahead and make an investment over there even if you do not meet the net profit condition fine now pri may make contribution to investment fund or a vehicle which is set up in ifsc which will be considered as opi see once you have understood the concept first 15 minutes we give you the concept building and once you have understood the concept it becomes easy for you to grasp all the things even if i'm reading a certain line you will probably know that okay fine i understand this but if you read the line for the very first time you will not understand it maybe probably you read the line for three times four times you will not understand so background of framework of any concept is very important once you understand the concept once you understand the meaning of the terms involved there in then you will have a better clarity so please invest more time in developing that framework or understanding it thereafter things will be very easy for you now a resident individual may make odi in a foreign entity resident individual may make odi in foreign entity including an entity engaged in financial services activity except banking and insurance in ifsc if such entity does not have a subsidiary or step down subsidiary it's the same thing that we have read before also now if 
If in IFSC also we have a recognized stock exchange, which we have actually, that shall be treated as um, RSE outside India. Okay, so just like we say that, okay, fine, there is a stock exchange in foreign jurisdiction. In the same manner, the stock exchange in IFSC is also going to be treated as a foreign uh, jurisdiction RSE for the purpose of these rules, right? Okay, rule number 16, pricing guidelines. Whatever transfer is happening from PRI, PRI to PROI, PROI to BRI, it is going to be at arm's length basis only. And the responsibility on ensuring compliance with the pricing is being entrusted on authorized dealer. Rule number 17, transfer or liquidation. A person resident in India holding equity capital in accordance with these rules may transfer such investment or maybe disinvestment, pricing guidance, documentation, reporting requirements in the manner as given in these rules. So of course, if you are doing uh, investing, if you are doing disinvestment, uh, the pricing guidelines, the documentation, conditions, everything is going to be according to the rules and regulations. Simple. If you are a PRI, you have equity capital. Can you transfer it? Yes, you can. How can you transfer it? You can sell it to some other PRI. You can sell it to some other PRI. But subject to that, other PRI should also be eligible to make investment. Or you can also sell it to some PROI. So if I hold equity capital, can I sell it? The answer is yes. I can sell it to another PRI. I can also sell it to PROI. Just like we sell our uh, holding equity holding in India. Now, if the transfer, if the transfer is happening on account of merger amalgamation or demerger on account of buyback of securities, then such transfer is going to be um, such transfer or liquidation in case of liquidation of foreign entity. If the foreign entity is liquidating, right, it shall have the approval of competent authority as per the applicable laws in India or the laws of the host country. So, if this is going to be self-explanatory. Compliance with requirements and rules, simple. Transfer by way of sale, uh, again, very simple. You can sell it. You can sell it to PRI also and you can sell it to PROI also. Then if it is a merger case, then you need the approval of authority. You may ask me, ma'am, which authority? So the authority has not been specified. So I cannot uh, actually go out and tell you that. Compliance of conditions in case of disinvestment. Now this you mark as important. Uh, I think I this also should be considered important. This is not so important. And uh, this I've already told you, right? These points which I've highlighted, I hope you know that because I've not marked a star. Don't consider. See, all these I, um, the points that I've highlighted, undoubtedly you have to remember that. Uh, um, very important. Okay. So, so, so we come back over here. Fine. Now, see, when we are disinvesting, so a person resident in India is disinvesting the overseas direct investment the transferer who is transferring right so you're disinvesting that means i am the person resident in india i'm disinvesting other than by way of liquidation if the foreign entity is closing down i don't have a choice other than disinvestment <coughs> transferer shall not have any dues outstanding for receipt where such transferer is entitled to receive from the foreign entity as an investor in equity, capital and debt. That means when you are disinvesting, you are not doing any partial disinvestment, you are doing entire disinvestment. That means certainly you are disassociating with that company. So you should disassociate in full. That means there shouldn't be any dues outstanding. Right? This is one condition. And 
your disinvestment must have stayed at least for one year see when we are we are not talking about opi we are talking about odi and odi is your financial commitment so that financial commitment should not be drawn or withdrawn uh, within a period of 3 months no if you have made an odi then it should stay for at least one year and if you are making entire full disinvestment then in such case you should not have any outstanding dues okay but these conditions are not going to be applicable in case of merger demerger amalgamation see that is not that is beyond your control so if two companies are being merged and that's why some disinvestment is happening in that particular company of course it will be swapped to another uh, company so that is something which is beyond your control and or maybe uh, because of that so that uh, in that case these conditions will not be applicable okay the holding of any investment or transfer shall not be permitted if initial investment was not permitted under the act this is just a clarification uh, line if you if you hold any investment in such manner uh, if your initial investment was not permitted your further investment will also not be permitted simple then we have rule number 18 which is restructuring this is also interesting you can say what is happening in this particular rule you are talking about restructuring what is restructuring see whenever i have invested in a foreign entity and that foreign entity is incurring a lot of losses now when a company is incurring losses maybe they need capital restructuring right they need to revive the company right just like we have read about reduction of capital under companies act see we have balance sheet we have liabilities we have assets right supposedly i invested 50 lakhs into this particular company and we bought the assets worth rupees 50 lakh now there is a land which has depreciated heavily and from 20 lakhs it has come down to 2 lakhs that means i know or maybe land is something which will increase but maybe some part of assets has been lost to or some part of capital has been lost to losses so we know this will never be able to recover and will never be able to pay back 50 lakhs to our shareholders so we reduce the capital right we are um, extinguishing the liability we are reducing the capital there are different ways of reduction of capital so if we want to do that we go ahead and do that reduction of capital following the um, uh, provisions of companies act likewise if you have made odi in a foreign entity and they want to restructure their balance sheet then then what is going to happen it is permitted how is it permitted so there is a foreign entity which is incurring losses for previous 2 years subject to ensuring compliance with reporting so reporting documentation and other requirements and subject to diminution in the total value of outstanding dues so worth such pri on account of investment in equity and debt after such restructuring not exceeding the proportionate amount of accumulated losses first thing what is proportionate amount of accumulated losses supposedly there is a loss of 10 crore now i'm talking in inr of course if it is a foreign entity it will be somewhere in dollars or somewhere in other currencies so accumulated losses of 10 crore supposedly i hold 10% shares in that company so my proportionate share or my proportionate amount of accumulated losses will be 1 cr 1 crore right so that is my now whatever reduction is happening whatever capital reduction or whatever diminution is happening in the total value of outstanding dues towards such pri on account of investment in equity and debt after such restructuring shall not exceed that 1 crore so i hope that's clear you need certificate certificate if that diminution see diminution of capital reduction of capital alteration of share capital all these concepts you have read under companies act and you should probably know it there's a thin line of difference between that right so when we are doing that it is something which is permitted however what you have to ensure is that limit and you also have to ensure that certification is being provided if the invest uh, if 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 the diminution um is of such case where the original investment is more than 10 million usd or 
where the amount of such diminution exceeds 20% of the total value of outstanding dues towards the Indian entity or the investor, whatever the case be, right? You will submit the certificate to AD Bank. Your certificate should be dated not more than six months before the date of transaction. Clear? Rule number 19, restrictions and prohibitions. Ma'am, what we need to learn in this particular rule, that may be your question. You need to learn this, right? You need to learn this also. And you need to learn this also. So both these cases where certificate is required. Both the cases where certificate is required. One, if your original investment is more than 10 million USD. And second, if the diminution exceeds 20% of your total value. Okay. And uh, restructuring in case of losses, I hope the points are clear. Now, rule number 19. Rule number 19, some restrictions and prohibitions. General restrictions or general prohibitions like uh, in the same manner, we do not permit FDI, we also not, do not permit ODI in certain sectors, real estate, gambling and dealing with financial products which are linked to Indian rupee. The real estate activity has the same meaning as is assigned under FEMA, right? So just like we read about um, that FDI, we also read about these ODIs. ODI in startup is going to be from your own money only. Not allowed from borrowed funds that means if i'm talking about resident individual from own funds if i am talking about indian entity only from internal accruals what are internal accruals whatever profits you've accumulated internally so far so only from those profits only from those reserves you can make odi in the startups okay so the startups which are recognized under the laws of that host country, not our, we are not talking about Indian startups. We are undoubtedly talking about the overseas investments, so overseas startups, right? Now, no financial commitment in more than two years subsidiaries. Since it is not allowed in India, we do not permit it outside India also. So you're not going to make financial commitment in any such foreign entity which has more than two layers of subsidiaries. However, this... Um, Restriction is not applicable on banking company, NBFC insurance company and government company just like we have read in our Companies Act. The same thing is written over here also. Rule 20. Rule 20 is nothing. <clears throat> Mode of payment, deferred payment, reporting, realization, it is going to be as per regulations, fine, not a problem. And um, last rule, restriction on acquisition or transfer of immovable property outside India. This is, um, you can consider this to be important because the earlier regulations that we had for immovable properties have been suppressed by this. So now we have this only. So if I am a PRI and I want to transfer or acquire any immovable property outside India, I need permission from RBI. It could be a general permission, which is given for everyone. It could be special permission, right? Now, if, if it is a property which is held by PRI, who is of national state, that means maybe we have a foreign national who came to India for some job. So he took up a job over here and now he has become a person resident in India, but he's a citizen of some foreign state, foreign country only. So, okay, fine. He can take the property, not a problem, right? If it is acquired by person even before 1947, no problem at all. You continue to hold it. Or if it was acquired by person resident in India on lease, See, if we consider uh, lease for maybe 7 years, 10 years, generally we consider 99 years lease also is being given. So that property somehow we consider to be freehold only. Otherwise, it's a leasehold property and more importantly, lease of just 5 years. Right? So not exceeding 5 years, that's just a lease that is not even acquiring a property. So that these, these rules are not going to be applicable on these 3. Learn it. Next, allowed acquisition of property from PRI and PROI. Okay, fine, ma'am. So, we have a PRI that can acquire a movable property outside India by way of inheritance or gift. Or you can purchase it from PRI also, who has acquired the property according to the proper laws. Okay, you may acquire property outside India from a PROI. 
by inheritance by whatever you have in your rfc account by using your lrs 250000 withdrawal provided such remittances under lrs may be consolidated in respect of relatives also that means if i have a family of 4 then 250000 us dollar into 4 that that is 10 lakh us dollar that i can collect and i can invest in an immovable property outside india i can even acquire it jointly with my relative who is a proi so if there is a proi i can jointly hold a property with him i can acquire the property out of income of sale proceeds of other uh, assets other than odi so if I have some immovable property outside India, I can sell it and acquire another property. That's not a problem. An Indian entity having an overseas office. So we have an Indian company which has a branch office over there and they want to acquire a movable property for maybe their business or maybe for some residential purpose for their staff. They can acquire it according to the directions which are issued by RBI. Okay. Now we talk about allowed transfer. Okay, allowed transfer. PRI, who already has acquired a movable property, they may transfer by way of gift to PRI, who is eligible to acquire, or they may also create a charge on such property according to the directions by RBI. The holding of any investment in immovable property or transfer thereof in any manner shall not be permitted. Again, the same point. You cannot hold, you cannot transfer if your initial investment was illegal or not permitted under the Act. Right? 